Hello, this is Dr. Jordanov. This is going to be a brief lecture on the radiographic assessment of arthritis. I'd like to introduce a systematic approach for the radiographic assessment of arthritis, which is based on the pattern of joint destruction, the distribution of disease, and ancillary findings such as erosions, soft tissue swelling, and soft tissue calcification. The first thing that I do when assessing for arthritis is I ask myself, is any joint narrowed or destroyed? In other words, are there findings of arthritis? If the answer is no, then you're done. The patient does not have arthritis. Sometimes a joint is obviously destroyed, as in this example. Other times, the narrowing may be a lot more subtle. And what I typically do when looking for subtle narrowing of a joint is I find the most normal comparable joint and I use it as a standard to compare all the other joints of its kind. This would help you find subtle narrowing. So here's what I do. The first thing that I do is I look for the pattern of joint destruction. How is the joint affected? Is it a degenerative type of arthritis or is it an inflammatory or infectious type of arthritis? Are there any erosions? Are there any hypertrophic changes such as chondrosclerosis and marginal osteophyte formation? Is the mineralization normal both around the joints and the overall mineralization of the bones that I see in the field of view? Is there any soft tissue swelling and if so what kind of soft tissue swelling? And finally, are there any calcifications in the soft tissues? The next step is to decide or to analyze what the distribution of disease is. Which joints are affected? Is the joint involvement symmetric or asymmetric? There are two broad patterns of joint destruction, degenerative and inflammatory. Let's start by talking about degenerative type of joint destruction. And this is basically osteoarthritis. You can see here an AP radiograph of the knee, and you can see the typical hallmarks of osteoarthritis. The joint is non-uniformly narrowed. You can see that on the medial side of the knee, we have severe joint space narrowing with bone-on-bone -bone configuration. On the lateral side of the joint, the joint spaces, if anything, are de factually widened. We have subchondral sclerosis, which is this wider appearance in the subchondral part of the bone, and we have marginal osteophytes. I've underscored non-uniform just to, to highlight that when we're talking about a single joint, we talk about uniform versus non-uniform narrowing. When we talk about symmetric or asymmetric, we're comparing left to right. So when talking about a single joint, you should use the term non-uniform. Two other features may or may not be present in osteoarthritis, and these are subchondral cysts and loose bodies. In inflammatory arthritis, the pattern of joint destruction is very different. First of all, we're dealing with a uniform joint space narrowing, and that's because with inflammatory arthritis or infection, we have inflammatory markers, you know, cytokines, we have white blood cells, and they're destroying the cartilage of the joint non indiscriminately. Basically, the whole cartilage is being destroyed together. And that's why you end up with a uniform joint space narrowing. Also very conspicuous here is the lack of hypertrophic changes. We don't have osteophytes and we don't have subchondral sclerosis. In fact, we have quite the opposite. We often have erosions and we have periarticular demineralization. If you window so that you can see the soft tissues better, you'll also often appreciate soft tissue swelling about the involved joints. Let's talk about the distribution of the common arthritis next. We'll start with osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis commonly affects the first carpal metacarpal joint and the scaphotrapezial trapezoid joints. 
it also affects the interphalangeal joints of the fingers. Notice that the metacarpophalangeal joints are usually spared, as are the remaining carpal compartments. Rheumatoid arthritis affects all of the carpal compartments and the metacarpophalangeal joints. It often affects the PIP joints, the proximal interphalangeal joints as well. It does not affect the distal interphalangeal joints, typically. So rheumatoid arthritis is a more proximal disease. Rheumatoid arthritis typically affects the hands and the feet symmetrically, which means that the right and left hands will be affected in a very similar fashion. Erosive osteoarthritis has the same distribution as osteoarthritis. The difference is that in this condition we have central erosive changes which result in a typical gull wing deformity. This disease affects middle-aged to elderly females and it straddles the fence between degenerative and inflammatory arthritis. Calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate crystal deposition disease, or CPPD, destroys joints in a degenerative fashion. So the joints are destroyed the same way that osteoarthritis destroys joints. What's different is the distribution. So if you see a joint that is narrowed in a degenerative fashion, but the distribution of disease is atypical for, for osteoarthritis. Think about pyrophosphate arthritis. Here's the typical distribution of CPPD. You see involvement of the metacarpophalangeal joints, which we don't see with idiopathic osteoarthritis. The radioscaphoid and the lunato-capitate articulations are also commonly affected, and this is atypical for osteoarthritis. The only time we might see osteoarthritic involvement of the radioscaphoid or radiocarpal joint is if we've had a prior intraarticular fracture of the distal radius or the scaphoid or prior injury to the scaphoid lunate ligament, so in the setting of prior trauma. We may or may not see chondrocalcinosis and typical locations would be the triangular fibrocartilage or the hyaline cartilage of the carpal bones. Psoriatic arthritis is a seronegative spondyloarthropathy. When we see inflammatory arthritis, but it doesn't quite fit RA, you should think about psoriatic arthritis. Psoriatic arthritis affects the hands asymmetrically. It also prefers the interphalangeal joints. The metacarpophalangeal joints may be affected as well. Here, the mineralization is normal. Remember that in rheumatoid arthritis, both the periarticular and the generalized mineralization may be decreased. In psoriatic arthritis, we actually have hypertrophic changes, and they're typically manifested by fluffy periosteal newborn formation. The soft tissue swelling differs as well. Here, the swelling involves an entire digit, and that's termed sausage digit. In rheumatoid arthritis, the soft tissue swelling tends to be periarticular. Let's look at some examples. Here we have a standing APV of both knees and a lateral view of the left knee. And again, we see the typical hallmarks of osteoarthritis. We have non-uniform narrowing of the joint spaces. We have secondral sclerosis and marginal osteophytes. And on the lateral view here, we see multiple loose osteochondral bodies. These are typical for osteoarthritis. We have loose bodies which range wildly in size from very small to very big. A joint effusion is present as well. Here's osteoarthritis in the hand. We see the typical distribution uh, with involvement of the first carpal metacarpal joint uh, and uh, lesser involvement of some of the interphalangeal joints. Again, the first carpal metacarpal joint involvement is typical for idiopathic osteoarthritis. Other joints affected by osteoarthritis are the hips, the knees, and the facet joints 
and SI joints in pubic symphysis. Here's a very different looking type of arthritis. The first thing we notice is that we don't really have much hypertrophic change. Uh, we have narrowing of multiple carpal compartments bilaterally. It's mild to moderate, but very uniform. Uh, notice the second metacarpal phalangeal joint on each side. It's mildly or moderately uniformly narrowed. We don't have any hypertrophic changes. We have bare area erosions here, here, and here. We have erosive changes in the metacarpal head as well. Notice how symmetric this disease affects the metacarpal phalangeal joints with the second MCP joints affected most severely bilaterally. We also have some narrowing of the PIP joints of the long fingers bilaterally with very symmetric bare area erosions. So this is a disease which narrows the joints uniformly, lacks hypertrophic response. We have bare area erosions, periarticular osteopenia, and the distribution is wrist compartments, MCP joints, and PIP joints. If you guessed rheumatoid arthritis, you are correct. This is indeed rheumatoid arthritis. Here's another patient, same distribution. We have involvement of the carpal compartments bilaterally, metacarpal phalangeal joints bilaterally, and PIP joints bilaterally. You see the symmetric distribution. There are very large erosions in the metacarpal heads bilaterally. This again is rheumatoid arthritis. One additional finding that we see here are erosions in the ulnar styloid on both sides with marked soft tissue swelling adjacent to the ulnar styloids. This uh, may mean that the patient has extensor carpal ulnaris tenosynovitis. This is another patient with similar distribution of disease, carpal joints, MCP joints. Notice that the carpal bones are fused bilaterally. We see this with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Here is another patient uh, in whom we see erosions in several carpal bones and prominent erosions within the ulnar styloids bilaterally with overlying soft tissue swelling, sort of this lumpy swelling. This is an MRI showing severe tenosynovitis of the extensor carpal ulnaris tendon. You can see the erosive changes in the ulnar styloid. This is another patient with rheumatoid arthritis and tenosynovitis. In the feet, the distribution is similar. The metatarsophalangeal joints are commonly affected, as are the PIP joints. You can see very large erosions in multiple metatarsal heads. One of the earliest erosions that you can see in the skeleton are erosions in the lateral aspects of the fifth metatarsal heads. These erosions occur in the feet first uh, before you see erosions in the hands. Here's another patient with more subtle erosive changes in the fifth metatarsal head, third metatarsal head. You can see erosive changes on MRI, and MRI is much more sensitive than conventional radiographs in detecting these early erosions. Also, uh, you should know that active erosions enhance with intravenous gadolinium administration, whereas inactive treated erosions do not. The T2 hyperintense abnormalities within the erosion will persist indefinitely, so they cannot tell you whether the erosion is active or not. These are AP and lateral views of an elbow, and again you see very uniform narrowing of the radiocapitellar and ulnohumeral articulations, as well as the presence of a large joint effusion. We see periarticular demineralization. What we don't see are subchondral sclerosis and marginal osteophytes. The pattern of disease uh, within this joint is consistent with inflammatory arthritis or infectious arthritis. This is a, an example of rheumatoid arthritis in the elbow. This is a lateral view of the cervical spine obtained with the patient's neck flexed. And we see a very important finding 
the predental space, which is a space between the odontoid process and the anterior arch of C1, is severely widened in this patient, measuring nearly 15 millimeters in width. Here's a close-up. This is a patient with rheumatoid arthritis and atlantoaxial subluxation. The inflammatory panis destroys the attachments of the transverse ligament and results in atlantoaxial subluxation. This is the same patient in neutral and extended position with the prudental space normalizing in width. Switching gears, here we have a PA radiograph of the hand and what we see are severe degenerative type changes in the first carpal metacarpal joint. We also have degenerative type changes in the metacarpal phalangeal joints. You see that unlike in the patients that we, see, that we saw previously with rheumatoid arthritis, here we have joint space narrowing, but a lot of increased density and also prominent marginal hook-like osteophytes. The presence of degenerative type changes in a distribution which is atypical for osteoarthritis means that this patient has pyrophosphate arthritis or CPPD arthritis. We should look for chondrocalcinosis in the typical places and indeed we have some right here within the triangular fibro cartilage. We also have some chondrocalcinosis within hyaline cartilage here as well as here. We also have typical degenerative changes in several interphalangeal joints and some soft tissue calcification. So this is the typical appearance of pyrophosphate arthritis or CPPD arthritis. Here's another patient with the same condition. Uh, we have narrowing of the metacarpophalangeal joints with very large hook-like osteophytes, chondrocalcinosis. There's a differential diagnosis for chondrocalcinosis and it includes three conditions, CPPD, hyperparathyroidism, and hemochromatosis. CPPD is the most common of these. There's also differential for metacarpal head hook-like osteophytes and it's a very short one, pyrophosphate arthritis and hemochromatosis. Here's a PAV of the wrist and we see a very characteristic pattern of joint destruction characteristic for pyrophosphate arthritis. We have severe narrowing of the radioscaphoid joint and severe narrowing of the lunato-capitate articulation with widening of the scaphalunate interval. Some people talk about a stair-stepping effect because you're uh, going up a level. We also see chondrocalcinosis. Here's another patient with the same pattern of joint involvement, radioscaphoid, lunato-capitate, widening of the scaphalunate interval consistent with scaphalunate ligament disruption. Another patient with the same type of uh, joint involvement. Again, we see widening of the scaphalunate interval. We see very large degenerative subchondral cysts. Notice how in this patient, the capitate has pushed its way proximally, further splaying the scaphoid and lunate. This is called scaphalunate advanced collapse. There's a differential for scaphalunate advanced collapse, and it includes CBPD, rheumatoid arthritis, and prior trauma. Another example of pyrophosphate arthritis, these are AP radiographs of the knees showing chondrocalcinosis within the menisci bilaterally. Notice that the medial and lateral joint spaces are relatively preserved while the patellofemoral compartments are severely narrowed bilaterally. Pyrophosphate arthritis has a predilection for the patellofemoral compartment. Idiopathic osteoarthritis tends to affect the medial or the lateral compartment severely as well. We're switching gears one more time. Here we have a disease which is affecting the interphalangeal joints of both hands. Um, we do have subchondral sclerosis and prominent, margin, prominent marginal osteophytes. In addition, we have central erosive changes which result in classic gull wing deformities. 
This is a nice example of this. Here's another example here, and perhaps another example here. Um, this is a middle-aged female, and this is the classic appearance of erosive osteoarthritis. You'll notice that the distribution is typical for idiopathic osteoarthritis, but the presence of these central erosions and gall wing deformities make this erosive osteoarthritis. Here's a close-up of the gall wing deformity. Sometimes the central erosions result in more of a corrugated or puzzle piece uh, appearance where you have multiple uh, areas that are protruding into each other. Here's a typical gall wing deformity. And this is erosive osteoarthritis. Here's a severe form of erosive osteoarthritis with subluxations, uh, severe destruction of these joints. The distribution, again, is typical for erosive OA. Now, here we have a disease which is affecting both interphalangeal and metacarpophalangeal joints. We have severe erosive changes with severe joint space narrowing. Here's a joint which uh, is severely destroyed with these large erosions in the base of the middle phalanx. Eventually, this will result in a penciling cup appearance. Here we have a marginal erosion with some periosteal newborn formation on top of it. Uh, we have soft tissue swelling in several fingers. Here's the long finger which looks swollen all the way through. Uh, these are the findings of psoriatic arthritis. This proliferative change, this covering of an erosion with periosteal new bone is typical of psoriatic arthritis. Another patient with psoriatic arthritis, we see advanced erosive changes, subluxation and angulation, and we also see ankylosis of a joint. This is a more subtle example. Uh, we see ankylosis of the distal interphalangeal joints of the pinky fingers bilaterally, ankylosis of the DIP joint here. Uh, this joint is nearly ankylosed. Notice the interphalangeal uh, distribution. The MCP joints in this patient are preserved bilaterally, as are the carpal compartments bilaterally. Here's a patient with psoriatic arthritis, a very early psoriatic arthritis, and all we see here is soft tissue swelling in the pinky finger of this hand. Uh, we really don't see any erosive changes yet or joint space narrowing, just a sausage digit. In the feet, psoriatic arthritis prefers the interphalangeal joints as well. This is a typical example. We have narrowed uh, joint. We have bare area erosions, and we also have this fluffy periosteal new bone formation, as well as some increased sclerosis. Another patient with a very similar appearance, we have a sclerotic distal phalanx, we have fluffy periostitis, and a lot of soft tissue swelling. This is reactive arthritis in a patient with HIV. Reactive arthritis can look very much like psoriatic arthritis. They are in the same differential. Another patient with a very similar finding, this is a densely sclerotic distal phalanx with fluffy periosteal knee bone formation. This is chronic osteomyelitis. So I've shown three cases, three different patients uh, in whom the distal phalanx looked very similar. Uh, and it nicely shows the differential diagnosis for this appearance, psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, and chronic osteomyelitis. This patient fell off a tree, broke his toenail, and subsequently got a chronic uh, infection. Here's another patient. Uh, this is a radiograph of the long finger. We see erosive changes uh, in the DIP joint with extensive soft tissue swelling. This could easily be psoriatic or reactive arthritis. Uh, in this patient, this turned out to be uh, due to a dog bite. This is the patient at presentation with the penetrating injury here uh, and subsequent infection. So this was a dog bite with subsequent septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. 
Here's a young patient. These are PA views of both hands, uh, and the only joint that's involved is this one. You can see here how this could be quite subtle. I showed this example in the beginning. So my advice again when evaluating the joints of the hands and wrists for narrowing is to find the most normal looking metacarpal phalangeal joint and to compare all the other metacarpal phalangeal joints to your normal standard. If you do that, you will always uh, be able to discover this, th that this joint is narrowed. The other joints look normal. Similarly, find the most normal interphalangeal joint and compare the other joints to it. You'll see that all the interphalangeal joints here are normal. Similarly, find the most normal looking carpal joint and then compare everything else to it. All these joints look normal. So we have a single joint involved by an inflammatory or infectious pattern of joint space narrowing. Uh, when you see that single joint, you have to think of infection. And indeed, this was infection. This was gonococcal arthritis. I'm going to switch gears yet again. Here we have PA views of the hands and wrists in a patient. Uh, we have uh, atherosclerotic calcifications. When we see these calcifications, um, they're caused basically by two things, either by uh, long-standing diabetes mellitus or long-standing renal insufficiency. The other thing that we have here are these very large periarticular erosions bilaterally. Uh, these erosions have well-defined corticated margins. I'm going to zoom in on the fingers of this hand uh, and show you this erosion in particular here. Notice how large it is. It's got a nice corticated margin. And then it has this hook-like feature here. This is called an overhanging edge. There's uh, a lot of soft tissue density within the soft tissues in the region of the erosions. And these are the classic findings of gout. Here's another example. This time in the foot, we have large periarticular erosions with corticated edges, extensive soft tissue uh, density overlying the erosion. Uh, this is the gouty tophus. Uh, gout loves the tarsal metatarsal joint, so you typically see these erosions crawling up the metatarsal bases. Same patient. I hope that this was helpful. Uh, thank you for your attention.